Contact tracing is proving to be one of the most powerful tools in public health to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Tonight we speak with an epidemiologist who is working hard to track down those who may have come into contact with an infected person. Temperatures today well above average and it's going to get hot by Saturday. Your complete forecast coming up next. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Krem News at 6 tonight. I'm Mark Hanrahan. I'm joined by my colleague Whitney Ward who is broadcasting from her home tonight. Good evening, Whitney. Good evening, Mark. Yeah, it's hard to believe that we are closing in on almost three months of this coronavirus shutdown. And over the course of all those months, it has become very clear that contact tracing is one of the most effective tools we have to control the spread of this virus. Today, I talked exclusively with one of those contact tracers, an epidemiologist from Spokane Regional Health. She told me this is a tough job and it's getting even tougher. Is they're ideally notified by their healthcare provider first, and the healthcare provider then reports to us that they tested positive, which they're required to do by law. Then that starts the ball rolling amongst our team to start the case and contact investigation process. After someone gets that positive diagnosis, what is the first step? So we'll call a person on the phone. Um, so these are all phone contacts that we make with people. It's very rarely done in person. And we'll talk to the person about their illness, kind of confirm their symptoms when their symptoms started, because that gives us an idea as to when they were infectious. And then we will talk to them also about their uh, living situation, their employment situation, and then the other individuals that could have been exposed to them while they were infectious. When people have symptoms, they're infectious for 48 hours before their symptoms start until um, at least 10 days after their symptoms start. How concerned are you with where they think they may have contracted the, the virus? Oh, we're definitely concerned. Um, you know, sometimes it's completely impossible to figure out where somebody picked up the virus, but other times it can point to a potential outbreak setting that we weren't aware about. So sometimes you recognize that you're not always going to get all the answers. Is that right? That's true. Mm -hmm. is, is that hard? Do you worry uh, about that? I do. I mean, of course, we're relying on people to tell us the truth and give us complete information. And, you know, some people may not be willing to cooperate with us and give us complete information. Other people, you know, they may have the, the issue of time and, and memory. You know, sometimes you have to go back a week and it's really difficult to remember exactly where you were on certain days and who you were with. You know. How concerned are you about just kind of casual encounters, places like Costco or the grocery store or standing in line at the pharmacy or stuff like that? Risk of infection is um, relative to uh, place and time and proximity and time. So the longer that you're in close proximity to somebody who is infectious, the more likely it is that you are to get sick. It's not without risk that you could be walking by someone as they were coughing or sneezing or speaking loudly um, and you could become infected that way. Um, however, um, most um, infection is likely to occur when you're in a more, more prolonged close setting. Does it concern you that as we open up a little more and a little more you know, every few weeks that your job will get harder? Yes, I think about that a lot and it's hard to think about how how many people are likely to get sick as you know people start relaxing their social distancing and that is the thing that we're trying to avoid is people getting sick and people you know being hospitalized and you know people dying those are the things we don't want to see whenever you're asking people exactly who they've been in contact with for that many days are there ever certain things that really concern you when you hear them that are definitely red flags gatherings even a small family you know birthday party or celebration can be really detrimental because so many people say we just went over there one time we just went over to their house one time. Um, does it concern you when you hear pe people say stuff like that? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's all it takes. You know, even a brief visit of 10 to 15 minutes puts you at significant risk. And we're taking it very, very seriously and really want to make sure that our community is protected. 
So as seriously as they are taking those contact investigations, they want the rest of us to take it just as seriously and stay vigilant about social distancing and wearing a mask and washing your hands and really limiting your contacts with people who are only within your household. They don't want you mingling with other people from other households yet. Today she told me we are simply not out of the woods yet. In the meantime, very big news for the state of Idaho. Governor Brad Little officially moving the state into phase three of reopening. For the latest on that, we are turning to Regina on live in the newsroom. Regina. Well, Whitney, by this Saturday, Idaho will officially be in phase three. Bars and movie theaters will be open. Here's what else will be open to the public. Let's take a look at what will be open this weekend. In phase three, gatherings of both public and private will be available for 10 to 50 people. Physical distancing and precautionary measures will be observed, of course. Not essential travel can resume to locations that allow it. Visits to senior living facilities and congregate facil facilities like jails will be allowed. Nightclubs will, will remain closed, but can open as a bar if protocols are met. Outdoor pools, splash parks, and water parks will re reopen as well. All of these new openings must have a plan in place, though, to prevent the spread of COVID-19 like proper sanitation, limiting the number of people, and proper physical distancing. Prosperity and safety are linked. Protecting our citizens is the right thing to do, and our economic rebound depends upon it. Large venues like sporting venues will remain closed, but Governor Little says as a plan, he has a plan in order to open up in stage four. Also, the governor recommending people enter Idaho from un another part of the country or anywhere with a high number of community spread should quarantine for 14 days and stage three will go until June 12th for Idaho and stage four is set to begin June 13th if no significant increase in cases and criteria are met. Live in the newsroom tonight, Regina on Mark back to you. Regina, thank you very much. Well, we are heading into some pretty warm weather for the rest of the weekend. The first part of the weekend a fantastic opportunity to fire up the grill. That's exactly what our very own Tom Sherry is doing tonight. Tom, this is always an exciting time of year for us because you fire up the grill and cook for us today, though. You're kind of at home doing a little bit differently. Yeah, uh, well, I actually I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. We have a, a brand new outside weather set and barbecue that we're hopefully going to be debuting for everyone next week. Uh, at this, uh, so in the meantime, we decided to rush home to my house and a couple of things I want to cover. We're going to do the barbecue forecast for you. We've got ribeyes. We'll talk all about it. It's going to be beautiful with a beautiful avocado salad. But in the meantime, I really want to impress upon folks that we have a real threat of thunderstorm activity activity developing Saturday night into Sunday. It is going to become very hot on Saturday. We're going to look for daytime highs to climb up around 90 degrees and then we've got a cold front. I mean, we're going to drop temperatures by 20 degrees easy by the, from Saturday to Sunday. And of course, when you get that kind of a frontal system, you get the chance of real big thunderstorms developing. So I just want everyone to be aware of that, especially if they're going to be out camping or boating uh, this weekend. So again, Thunderstorms expected on Saturday, late Saturday afternoon, Saturday night into Sunday. Right now it is absolutely gorgeous. We're at 79 degrees here in the uh, Spokane area. Wind out of the north northeast at five miles per hour. Satellite and radar picture, as you can see, showing a few showers to the north of us. But we have high pressure that's pushed in across our area. That leads to this gorgeous weather. Get out and take a walk tonight. 68 at 9 p.m. 68 degrees at 9 in the evening. My God. Gosh, overnight lows only dropping down into the mid 50s. Tomorrow we'll look for a daytime high of 85, again, well above the average high of 70 for this time of year. And we'll look for the weekend. I'll run it by one more time for you. 90 on Saturday, thunderstorms developing Saturday night into Sunday, windy on Sunday, cloudy with a chance of rain showers and a daytime high of 69 degrees. Now we'll tell you the best day this weekend for you to get out in your backyard and grill for your family. Uh, we'll also talk about your 10 day outlook all coming up in a few minutes. Back to you, Mark. Man, looking forward to that, Tom. By the way, might I just add your backyard's looking pretty fantastic, my friend. I'm kind of jealous and feeling bad about mine. <laughs> the honeydew list is the backyard. <laughs> yeah. Two and a half months of quarantine right here, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. He is a man of many talents. Tom Sherry, thank you very much. We'll check back in with you later in the show. 
All right, states are reopening more businesses as coronavirus related restrictions start to ease, but workers are still being impacted by the economic fallout from the pandemic. According to the Labor Department, 2.1 million people filed for unemployment benefits during the week ending in May 23rd. More than 40 million people have been out of work at some point since the pandemic started. Right now, some 21 million people are collecting benefits. Washington officials say the state has recovered $300 million from criminals who use stolen information to file fraudulent unemployment benefit claims. The Employment Security Department commissioner said the initial recovery was a result of the state's collaboration with federal law enforcement and financial institutions. The personal information of tens of thousands of people in Washington was used fraudulently to receive hundreds of millions of dollars in unemployment benefits. Amazon shareholders were recently informed of health and safety concerns inside warehouses. Yesterday's online forum was a first for Amazon and included founder Jeff Bezos. One longtime Amazon employee who was fired for speaking publicly about her concerns addressed Bezos directly as part of a resolution from other shareholders. Amazon's pollution and its um, carbon footprint is not just huge, it's also disproportionately impacting communities of color. We filed a shareholder resolution asking Amazon to be accountable for that and to make it right. Bezos, meantime, told shareholders the company has taken the situation seriously from the very beginning. Hey, before we head to the break, want to share the spotlight on a local senior. Big shout out to Devin Winter, a senior at St. Mary's High School. We love giving these seniors shout outs, so keep sending them our way. Just text 2020 to 509-448-2000 and we'll send you the submission link. We'll be right back with more news.